Next one, we are arranging for our uh, first session uh, will be <coughs> on the uh, transportation for better life, future potential of transportation and urban mobility post-COVID era. And this first session will be moderated by Professor Dr. Atuchi Fukuda, a trans honorable advisor from New York University, Japan. And I think we, we are actually catch up in time. So we actually uh, have about five more minutes before we start. So I think while we are getting ready to set up uh, our guests online, who join online, can we uh, continue the, the first session? Good morning, Professor Fukuda. Can you yes, hear me? Good morning. Oh, okay. Yes, good morning. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I think we are actually catching up on time now. So I think we have a few more minutes just to try to make sure yes, that the sound yes, system is yes, good. Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. Good morning again, all participants. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome to the session one, uh, entitled on the transportation for better life, future potential of transportation and the urban model post. COVID era. So this is a very interesting session and uh, we have really distinguished four speakers in this session. So uh, I can, I'm very sorry, but uh, we actually would like to listen a lot, but uh, we can allocate only 20 minutes for each speakers. So uh, please allow us to do this. So I maybe uh, invite one by one then uh, finally, we can have a little bit of time to have a question and answer. And if you have any question online, maybe you can uh, write on the chat. So maybe I can check and then maybe uh, manage the question and answer, please. So by the way, okay, the, I, may I invite uh, Professor uh, Haruo Ishida? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, may I introduce a little bit? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, he graduated the University of Tokyo, and uh, he started the career from Tokyo Institute of Technology, I believe. Then uh, he served uh, around 35 years at the Tsukuba, University of Tsukuba. Now he's a chairman of the Research Institute of Road and the Street, and also emeritus professor of the University of Tsukuba, and also uh, he kindly served for our university as a visiting professor. Uh, he, of course, uh, involved many important council and the in, uh, initiative of our government in Japan. So recently, he also involved the uh, policy of the smart cities. So anyway, uh, title of his presentation today is Smart Cities in Japan, Achievements and the Challenges. So, Professor Ishida, please. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Professor Fukuda for a, a very detailed uh, introduction. Uh, I am uh, Ishida, and it is my great uh, honor to be appointed as a distinguished guest speaker. And also it is my great pleasure to uh, deliver a, a short speech titled uh, Smart City in Japan. Uh, let me share my screen. Everyone can see the screen? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, my title is Smart City in Japan. Uh, today's big theme is a recovery from the pandemic, COVID-19. And the uh, smart cities has uh, very strong uh, relationships between the uh, recovery from some pandemic because making our cities regions and our lives and the industries uh, more uh, and more resilient against any uh, disasters, including pandemic, uh, is one of the most important target of smart cities. And the, let me talk about the concept and the challenge, uh, implementation and the achievement and our challenges of smart cities in Japan. Uh, since this is my first appearance to the uh, Asian Transport Research Society. Uh, please, uh, yeah, so let me uh, introduce myself briefly. Uh, as Professor Fukuda introduced me, uh, basically the academic uh, 
uh, site. And the, so now I am talking about uh, uh, my public services to national government. Uh, recently, I'm involved in the uh, various uh, 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 councils and the uh, committees uh, of the, say, cabinet office. Uh, what, the first one is uh, I'm a member of Committee on Green Innovation Strategy Development and Driving. And the Japanese government has decided to set the carbon neutral policy as a center of its national policy. And the, I'm a member of this uh, Green Innovation Strategy. And the, uh, I'm also chair of the committees on smart city guidebooks. Uh, green innovation strategy, as well as the committee uh, and smart cities, uh, have a has a very wide relationship you know, among the uh, many ministries. So that's why the headquarter of this uh, complicated uh, committee uh, uh, in Prime Minister's cabinet office. And it's but uh, mainly I'm. <coughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm involved in the uh, committee of the Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transport and Tourism. And the, uh, regarding my today's topics, I'm a chair of the advisory committee of Smart Jump. Smart Jump is a uh, Japanese government policy to uh, promote and collaborate with Asian countries regarding the smart city. And, the, uh, and the recently, I, 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 I have some relationships between METI, Ministry of Economy, Industry, and Trade. And I'm a member of uh, autonomous, autonomous driving businesses, uh, which is a very deep relationships uh, to the new mobility and the new uh, urban and the industries. The first slide is this. What is smart city? Uh, this is a Japanese government uh, <coughs> formal explanation of smart city. Smart city is an initiative to solve urban and regional problems and create new values by utilizing advanced technology and management. And the uh, Japanese government has a, <coughs> a big uh, techni technique and innovation goals, that is a society 5.0. And the, uh, the smart city is a showcase of this society 5.0. And the, we are now in the some, some, something around uh, uh, step one and step two, demonstration for smart cities, implementation of smart cities. And the, uh, in the new near future, we hope we have uh, realized a society 5.0. And the uh, smart cities objectives of a smart city is enhancing of well-being of citizens. Uh, cities, urban or urban lives are uh, supported in many, many uh, services. Uh, uh, energy, water, and the sewage, waste, health, medical, safety, education, and uh, automatic driving, and disaster management, including pandemic and the finance. So, uh, and as a very limited uh, resources, we have to uh, harmonize and uh, make the situation or uh, administrations and the business uh, uh, more and more effective by using the uh, uh, ICT or uh, data collaboration. <clears throat> so, but the uh, uh, target is uh, increase or enhancing of well-being of citizens. We don't, we cannot forget it. And it, so, uh, to promote the smart city project in Japan, uh, we have developed a smart city guidebook. And I'm very happy to be a chair of this uh, committee on guidebook. And the, in this guidebook, we extend three basic concepts 
So what the first one is uh, orientation to citizens and the user demand. Uh, well-being is a, a main target. Of course, we have to establish the issues and the visions to share with uh, peoples and uh, to implement the comprehensive uh, white uh, smart cities. We need cooperation and collaboration uh, across sectors and uh, cities. And this is a three basic uh, concept. And uh, in order to realize uh, this smart city or concept, we need five basic principles. The privacy is the most important and the security and the residency of uh, data or privacy, et cetera. And the interoperability, openness, and the transparency of this uh, data uh, society oh. communication, uh, sustainable in terms of operational funding is also uh, very important issues. And the fairness and the inclusiveness, uh, that is a very basic idea of SDGs. And uh, we have now a uh, smart city project in all over the Japan. Uh, in, in this year, uh, uh, national government uh, like METI, uh, Ministry of uh, e Economy, Trade and Industry, and the EMLIT, uh, Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Tourism, uh, MCI, uh, Ministry of Communication and uh, uh, Interiors, and the cabinet office have uh, uh, different uh, as, uh, <coughs> uh, and assistance schemes. But uh, we have to integrate this city under uh, my uh, committees. Uh, this year, we are uh, assisted 60 projects in uh, to, uh, 42 cities. And uh, let me uh, briefly uh, explain the achievement of our project. And uh, we realize a good cooperation and collaboration between local government and national government already. A local government issues is mainly based on their needs, problems. And this is very important to, to exactly understand what is a uh, uh, conditions and necessity. The national government uh, gives them the financial, technical, and the human resource assistance. And also, we have, we have set up the platform for sharing needs, problems, and results. And already, we have members. Uh, members are from municipality government, uh, industry sectors, uh, such as uh, mobility sectors, urban development sectors, or IT, or ICT, etc., etc. Et and the, uh, not only the selected cities, but also we have already 300 plus consortiums in each region of cities to discuss, plan, and implement smart city project across, across Japan. And this is a very uh, <laughs> important asset, uh, 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 I think. Uh, due to the time constraint, uh, let me uh, introduce you briefly the three representative example in Japanese smart city. One is uh, uh, Aizuwakama <laughs> city. <coughs> uh, population of Aizuwakama is 121,000. Uh, you can see the location in this. And in Aizuwakamats is very famous for uh, comprehensive uh, smart city. A wide bed, uh, mobility, settled bills, education, healthcare, energy, etc., etc., etc. They try to cover very wide variety of services. And the, to achieve this, they need collaboration among various stakeholders, uh, students, uh, academic, uh, uh, yes, uh, universities, and the 
、えー、と local companies and external companies, they, they develop, they try to develop the city OS, comprehensive、uh, operating system for、uh, city, smart city. A second example is、uh, Maiba City. Maiba City is famous for、uh, fast PDCA.、Uh, PDCA is very famous, it's, but it is very difficult to implement effectively and uh, uh, correctly. And uh, by utilizing the smart sensing and the big database, a data platform, they try to establish the fast PDCA and the EBPM. And so and the target is.、Uh, Urban planning, mobilities, and the <coughs> health, and the、uh, social welfare and education. Also, they cover a very wide range of services. And the third, but not least, is example is、uh, Akagawa City.、Uh, population is about 260,000. The, their target is how to protect the citizens. Against disasters, flood, accident,、uh, both、uh, traffic a c c i d e n t and the crimes to protect the children. And the,、uh, so, so、uh, surveillance is something、uh, c o n t r a d i c t、uh, with uh, private uh, uh, privacy. So they use the word warm watch. Over elderly problem,、uh, peoples and the children.、Uh, watching、uh, among the uh, people uh, itself. And、uh, this is my private observation、um, from the movement in three cities.、Uh, they have very ambitious visions. And of course, these visions are based on the Really, needs and problems. And the active and close co working in teams are, are, are very clear and powerful. Rich technologies and products are available. And the good leader and the architect is also, they have uh, uh, succeed, succeed in get to get. And the, in many smart cities, other, other than these three、uh, representative cities, They have the various things are tried and achieved and failed. And we can share these e x p e r i e n c e and the knowledge through the、uh, platform. <coughs> so, but uh, uh, I, I'm also chair to the selection of the smart city subsidy proposal. And I、okay. sometimes I feel some sense. That is like this. A mayor wants to make his her city better through smart city concept and request and request staff to develop plans. And for the staff, the easiest way is to follow the technical, methodological way, smart city flavor, I, I call it, and to employ it, IT consultant. This is not the real based. Uh, smart cities.、Uh, that is a very、uh, important you know, problem. To prevent this, we developed the Smart City Guidebook and Smart City Difference Architecture Guidebook. And uh, uh, sorry, this is still in Japanese <coughs> version only, but an、uh, uh, English version will come soon. You,、uh, I hope you can sh share、uh, our achievement soon. And the,、uh, this is my tentative conclusion of the smart city project in Japan. Five important points. The first one is building functional, flexible driving entities.、So、organization is very important.、Uh, financial power is,、uh, we can deny it.、Uh, public ac acceptance and support. Especially when we use the privacy data. And the city OS is very, very important. Since our smart city 
uh, that the platform applies are very, very complicated and the very, very uh, uh, how can I say, uh, closely related. And the, uh, these uh, respective uh, data, data platform and the uh, ap applications are uh, growing rapidly and independently. Mm -hmm. So to get a uh, harmonization, we, ha we need a big, good uh, operating system for city all. And the evaluation and the first PDCA is necessary and possible from the uh, trials of smart cities. And the good practice and the example of these five points are given in the uh, smart city guidebook. So what uh, we have uh, uh, the various problems too, that is the challenges. Uh, <coughs> Japanese cities, also ASEAN cities, and world cities have been trying to achieve many objectives, improvement of well-being, resilience, attractiveness, uh, <coughs> city management, economic vitality, or uh, uh, pursuit, the new urban forms and the lives uh, of post-COVID-19. And the smart city can be quite a powerful tool. We should collaborate further to produce, increase, and share in rich fruit of smart cities. And uh, this is the, just the objectives of smart city jump. Smart city supported by Japan ASEAN mutual partnerships. Implementation of concrete smart city project formation, a promotion of financial support for ASEAN smart city proposals, strengthening support for smart city in ASEAN countries, and smart smooth information sharing and the mutual co cooperation through JASCA homepage. Uh, smart jump is very important for Japan too. Uh, Japan also needs to be mobilized. We have to uh, win uh, uh, the very uh, many uh, difficult situations. Uh, to widen, deepen, and strengthen uh, mutual partnership, trust, and friendship, and uh, to synchronize development of Japan with uh, Asian, Asian, uh, ASEAN countries. This is my uh, last slide. Uh, we will go forward strongly and together. Thank you for your attention. That's my uh, presentation end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ishida. I'm very interesting about your presentation, but that we don't have time, so I have to go to the second presenter. Thank you. So, okay, uh, thank you. So, second presenter is uh, Professor Stan uh, Sugodo. Uh, he is a pre uh, professor of University of Indonesia. I believe that he graduated University of Indonesia, then he obtained his master and the doctoral degree from the University of Tokyo in Japan. And uh, of course, he uh, contributed to the academic society, but uh, he also uh, contributed to the government sector, such as the former deputy governor of Dekai Jakarta for trading industry and the transportation. And uh, also, I believe that he used to be the uh, international advise member of the International Advisory Board of the EAP, right? <laughs> So, uh, yes. So, his uh, topics is the um, thriving with the transport and urban systems in post-COVID era, Indonesia perspectives. So, sir, please. Right. Thank yes, you, Fukuda-sensei, for yes. your uh, brief inter introduction. And let me share my screen, man, and let me off my cam. Uh, you see already yeah, my presentation slides here? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, I tried to choose my, my topic today on uh, thriving with transport and urban system in post-COVID area. I believe this is not the only Indonesia perspective, but we share with a lot many cities and countries in the other part of the, of the globe, of course, because we are facing the same story of uh, COVID-19. Okay, 
Uh, actually, uh, we try to cope with the situation of pandemic COVID-19, but uh, we have to be able also, I think, uh, what about after the COVID? So uh, the statement that I have to raise here is actually, how good do we learn from pandemic COVID-19 to change our transport behaviors? And also, of course, after all, we have to thrive with it. So we have to be sustained with the transport system we choose. Well, uh, uh, of course, I'm uh, already introduced by uh, uh, Fukuda Sensei and also uh, he, he mentioned also I'm the IATS member. And right now I'm also the task force for the T2, yeah, for the task force 2, for the G20, because the presidency of the uh, G20 will be in Bali and our president, President Jokowi, will be uh, the, president, uh, the president of the G20 for next year. Uh, I try to look at the situation. I think this is very uh, common situation that we share with other countries as well. Yeah, because uh, during the pandemic, we are up and down with the situation, but uh, we are faced. Uh, we were facing actually the highest peak uh, during the Delta COVID. Yeah, it was like uh, sometime in July, August, and and then now we are declining. Uh, this very good situation right now that we have a very, very low growth and we expect that this is going to be uh, diminishing in the coming years. Uh, uh, however, we are uh, right now also facing some Omicron, but uh, I believe Omicron would, wouldn't be that serious as what we experienced in the last two or three months. Here, uh, the situation that you can see, uh, I think we believe we share also the situation like uh, you have in other uh, cities like Bangkok, maybe also in Tokyo, that we have limited the capacity of the public transport even. Yeah. Not only uh, having a social distance like this, one, two meters, but we have also to, to have a, a lower capacity of uh, public transport here in, in order to, to do or to run the uh, health uh, protocols. So uh, there are a lot, I think, uh, to learn from this situation because uh, in any way, I don't know whether we have to thank to the pandemic or not, but uh, we learned a lot because uh, I think there are a lot many human trips are not being done during the pandemic. And we learned a lot from that, like the work from home and everything else. So uh, I think it is good for us not to do the unnecessary trips and due to that, we can reduce a lot of emission and other and other uh, positive uh, impact that we can uh, raise here. Okay, uh, what is happening with the cities? What is happening in the urban areas? So, what what would be the sustainability of the expediency of the uh, urban city, the urban existing? Because we 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 know that uh, in the coming years there will be a lot and more and more people will be living in the in the urban areas. But due to the, the pandemic, we learned that less urban face-to-face -face activities are there. Yeah. So we are, we are, reducing, the we are reducing the face to face activities. So in that case, we are also looking at uh, the lot many office buildings which is quite empty. So in this case, I think we learned that there might be less office space required in the future. Also, uh, probably uh, we will we need uh, some, some sort of uh, footless working. So means that you can work everywhere, yeah, from home, from Starbucks, or any places you, you, you're uh, comfortable with, so that uh, the more co-working space probably will be required in the, in the coming years. See, also, we have some changes in the urban trips, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is not only uh, for goods movement, but also for people movement, because uh, some people are not doing their unnecessary trips. So, uh, and then uh, there are some coming phenomenon like uh, the flexible working hours. See, for example, I myself doing my, my job as a, a lecturer, as a professor at university, which is having sometime uh, timeliness is something, but really that we have to work probably more than 24 hours a day because due to that flexibility of working hours, sometime uh, you may have uh, to discuss with people probably during your rest time. I mean, your resting time. So this is a very uh, new phenomenon that we have to deal with now. And then also we have an, uh, a thing that you have to consider about the optimal last miles of person trips, also what's the goods movements, because uh, probably people are spending less of uh, or have their, their money for, for traveling, but uh, they're spending probably more for goods. Yeah. So we have to think about this. 
And also we are having some more uh, something to do with the new urban uh, facilities, yeah, the urban amenities for better life. And it should be designed in, in, this, in, the, in the context of smart atmosphere, as what uh, uh, Professor Ishida was mentioning. And I totally agree. And I think a lot many cities in the world is, I think, running for, for that kind of smart cities in the future. Uh, let's uh, try to uh, focus on the very specific problem that we are in. I mean, uh, I believe uh, we are in this conference, a lot many uh, stakeholders from academia, from private sectors, government, NGOs, you are dealing with transport. So there are a lot many impacts, I think, on economy coming from these sectors, but I try to pinpoint only two, uh, which is very common, that those are the total energy consumption from transport sectors and also the total emission. We believe the, uh, these two are very common to know and to measure that uh, we can look at this uh, situation, for example, uh, this uh, country like Indonesia is spending more than 40, 43%, I think, of this energy yeah, from transport sectors. U.S. is spending more than 26% and China is about 20%. And I believe uh, those two countries are spending more in industrial uh, sectors. As for the total emission, you, you can see that Indonesia is still uh, giving higher, higher position of uh, emission coming from the transport sectors, which is occupying like the 26% of the total uh, number. And also the U.S. like 29%, China is 10%. And I believe those two countries, again, are giving more emission coming from industrial uh, sectors. So from these two indicators, we can learn that how important to make a transport system uh, better and better in the coming years. And especially after all, we, we learn from the uh, pandemic situation of COVID-19. So this is very important. Uh, how do we thrive with this uh, uh, transport system in the future? <clears throat> Look, uh, I think I would, I would underline that the ICT is replacing people movement, mostly because if we look at this Zoom, we are doing now uh, what, what is happening with this uh, application. We are, we are chatting, we are meeting, we are having a lot many activities, uh, exchanging the information and uh, data, for example, within these uh, communications. So in this in this very particular situation of pandemic COVID-19, we are learning a lot of this. Yeah? And we are spending our time mostly with Zoom. Yeah? We are not going to your office. You are not going uh, anywhere to, to shop or any other activities, but you do all uh, based on this uh, ICT. Yeah? So uh, we believe that in the future and uh, learning from pandemic as well, uh, I believe the new part of office space works will be coming hybrid or maybe online, offline. And we are uh, changing also, not focusing on the production, rather we are trying to do something to do with the productivity, yeah? Because uh, productivity is something else. Yeah? We, are not, we are not going to stay with production, rather we are going to work on productivity base. Again, uh, we are, uh, I think we agree that uh, we will do something uh, more effective and efficient in our trips. So, we are reducing person trips yeah, and also improving the traffic uh, performance in a way because uh, they're, be, uh, they're becoming less and less uh, probably vehicle, uh, private vehicles moving on the road, for example. And due to that, I think we are also achieving also the efficiency of energy. And in that way, also quality of the environment will be getting better and better off. So uh, this is very... Uh, uh, a nice situation in the other way, uh, learn from the pandemic, even though there are not many casualties, but uh, something positive we have, uh, we have to learn from. Uh, I believe people movement is uh, still there, even though it's becoming less and less, as I can observe uh, in some routes, yeah, like the toll routes right now, that we are having less and less traffic, even though we are coming close probably to the normal situation, but I think there are some uh, changes already. So uh, what we have to do in the future, I think we have to be able I think, to make the balance between the private and public transport, because those two modes are going to be uh, in use, I think, by people, even though with the, uh, with the lower uh, demand probably. 
but uh, we have to be able, I think, to make a good connection between these two. Yeah. So yeah, we have to create a seamless situation of intermode and ortho internetwork uh, between uh, all the users. And we have to be able also to uh, convert the energy yeah, from the fossil base probably to renewable and environmentally friendly energy, as well as the automation of the uh, uh, vehicles, yeah, and also how to enforce this uh, vehicle in a better way, yeah, because we have a smart enforcement or enforcement right now is uh, uh, already being started in Jakarta, for example. And uh, for the smart public transport becoming more and more because uh, I think we are committed already to uh, to have more people using the public transport for any efficiency and effectiveness of the uh, movement. You know, uh, Jakarta, for example, is uh, making up some sort of statement to have uh, probably more and more public transport uses in which in the, in the year of 2030, we try to achieve that 60% of the total travel will be done by public transport. So imagine that would be a very, uh, very serious uh, services, I think. So we have to be able uh, to be smart in the planning and operation uh, level. And also we have to be able to, to do some sort of uh, smart financing for this public transport because we need more and more funding for this, as well as integrated policy uh, on pricing. Yeah. Of course, there are a lot many uh, integration between uh, mode of, of the cutting system, but uh, what is more important, I think, is to make more incentive by the uh, pricing policy. So in a way that we are going to make affordable and comfortable public transport for, for the citizens. Gusmatman is not going to be less, but I believe this is going even to be more because some people are spending less money for traveling, but they will be spending more money for uh, uh, goods that they are buying, yeah, their their expenditure will be more. That's why we have to be able, I think, to maintain a goods movement or the physical distribution or logistic. There will be covering the small supply chains management, the no empty backhaul, the integrated transport and warehouse operation, the last mile uh, deliveries. At now is already an, an issue. It's a big issue in in Jakarta, for example. And also we have to be able to digitalize all the logistic data and information management. Yeah. And then, of course, behind all this machine, behind all this system, they have to be human that uh, are smart and try to make some optimization process. Uh, and it should be uh, based on a real time situation. So uh, that, that too won't, won't be that sufficient because in the end, I think we have to be able, I think, to provide the, fine, the transport sector itself. And to that point, we need finance. And in this situation that uh, I think, uh, I don't know in other developing countries, but in Indonesia, we are facing actually some limited budget, the national limited budget for the uh, public uh, uh, transport sectors. That's why we, we try to raise some, some, some sort of cooperation between public and private partnership in this case. Yeah. Uh, it's been long many years, I think we have been doing this by BOT, BTO, BOO, yeah, or maybe uh, viability gap funding or maybe availability payment or something like that. But it is very important, I think, to make uh, uh, the participation and collaboration of the private sectors to join the, uh, the, the public domain, the so-called transport sectors here. So the strategic financing for infrastructures and facilities has to be there. And uh, I think this is important that uh, we we show that the government has to be uh, there, yeah, because infrastructure is really expensive. But then probably uh, in the sense of facilities, private sectors might be willing to get in with the with the kind of strategic financing. And finally, I would I would urge also I would like to urge also that the earmarking scheme of fundings, yeah, it means that. Uh, the 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 this uh, spending of money or coming from uh, uh, transport sectors should be coming also from transport sectors. Say, for example, when we try to uh, promote the ear, uh, the congestion pricing or the electronic road pricing, we try to do the marking. Means that uh, any single rupiah, any single uh, money that you spend from your scheme from the uh, private sectors, from the private vehicles, you have to be able, I think, to. To, to return that money to the development of public transport examples. So this kind of uh, strategy would be 
uh, effective, I think, to to promote the development of the transport sector, especially on public uh, transport. So, uh, what will be the uh, future of the uh, perspective? Yeah, future or the purpose perspective of the transport uh, in our country? I think uh, we share with other country as well. Yeah, I think uh, our government is uh, very much willing to promote the more use of public transport. And also the non-motorized transport, like the uh, bicycle. Yeah, we are we are developing more, <clears throat> more and more bicycle paths in the city. Yeah, and then also giving more incentive for public transport. But in the other way, also uh, we are doing uh, we are giving more disincentive to uh, private vehicle user. And also, uh, our government is uh, very much willing to have more uh, use of uh, green and renewable energy as our commitment also in the COP26 that we are trying to reduce the use of uh, fossil-based uh, energy like coal, uh, oil, and also gas. So we have to find a more uh, environmentally friendly en energy here. And also the government is uh, going, I think, uh, to make a, a very, very strict development of the uh, seamless good movement because we learned that the uh, logistic is occupying a lot of uh, spending of people so uh, this is what the so-called the uh, high cost economy happening in the uh, goods movement. Uh, one of the commitment is since from uh, this, uh, this first period of the, our president Jokowi in his office, I think they have been mentioning about the CETOL, yeah, but the CETOL is actually uh, aimed to be uh, a system that giving, uh, that giving more and benefit to the uh, uh, movement of the uh, uh, sea movement because you know that uh, our country is having a lot of uh, plenty of water in the sense of sea and the other thing is also the digitalization and electrification of vehicles in operation because uh, you know uh, there are a lot many things uh, right now in in place and we are going to do the e-enforcement for example yeah and promoting a lot the electric buses as well as the, the digitalized logistic system in operation. So this is uh, the things that uh, our government is now uh, very much uh, in, e in favor to do. And finally, also the uh, capital, yeah, the new capital that we are going to build and it has to be finished, I think in 2024, which is in, in some other island, the Kalimantan Island. And we believe that uh, government is being having some, some uh, master plan for this which is based on a smart city vision, as what uh, Professor Ishada has uh, mentioning a lot. I think this is the standpoint that we have for this uh, country, yeah. uh, not only because of the pandemic, but we are uh, looking at how to thrive, yeah? how we are sustained with this transport system in the future. So who are the doer here? Who, who are the, uh, the doer? I think uh, finally we have to look at and this is, I think, the importance that we have this kind of conference, the gathering of a lot many experts, academia, economists, you know, probably also NGO consultant and private sectors that we need some uh, transport innovation ecosystems, yeah, which is, it is going to involve a lot many actors yeah, from many different uh, institutions. And we are going also to involve their activities in place or their future plans activities as well as what the artifacts means that what we have right now, we have to be able, I think, to use it optimally yeah. while awaiting for a new, a new system that we can uh, really base on any smart uh, environment in this case. So, uh, well, I don't want to mention about the uh, uh, Ove and Grandson uh, statement or Marcus Robinson that what they, they, I quote. But uh, I believe these are the, the, the picture that uh, we have to go through with the transport innovation ecosystem. Uh, what I believe that how all of related stakeholder work in harmony, of course, in the context of uh, co-evolving competition as well as collaboration among those actors, yeah, among these actors. And I, not because I'm, I'm part of the, I'm part of the EATS, the, International Association of uh, Traffic Safety and Sciences, but I believe the safety issues could be the peak of iceberg to comprehend yeah, the appropriate actions and resources onto the transport system. Say, for example, when uh, I might be sharing you a little bit on uh, my uh, uh, BRT, the bus rapid transit, which is uh, currently having some accidents. Yeah. 
And I can see that from this accident, I can learn a lot that it is an iceberg that to know what is happening with the systems of this bus. What are the technology? Because there are sometimes not only a crash of accident yeah, on the road or they are hitting the pedestrian even, but sometimes the, there are some fire in the bus. So you can imagine that is something wrong, I think, with the technology, probably, probably also in management because uh, we are uh, not focusing on the safety issues uh, during the uh, operation, for example. So I think uh, this is the issue that we can raise together, how to thrive with the system. Yeah, especially in the basis of the in the basis of the smart environment, like what Professor Isida has mentioned. Okay, I don't want to spend uh, any longer uh, for my presentation, but I believe uh, it would be nice to have uh, a floor of discussion among the audience. Thank you so much, Professor Fukuda. See you. Thank you, Professor Stan. Uh, very informative information. You covered all issues in Indonesia. Thank you. So Thank you. let yeah let let me move to the next presenter. So next presenter is uh, Mr. Lene Santiago. Uh, he's the president of the Bellware Advisory right now, and uh, I believe that he graduated University of the Philippines. Then he ob he was obtained he obtained a master degree at the Asia Institute of Technology AIT in Thailand, uh, and uh, he served in the consulting for, uh, field around 40 years, and uh, he involved many projects. I heard uh, not only in the Philippines but also other ASEAN countries, and also he played a very important role for the Philippine government. He used to be advisor of the uh, secretaries, uh, secretary means the minister in another country, you know, of the Ministry of Transport, Philippines, I believe. So uh, his title is the Public Transport Reforms, uh, Journey to the Three Access of the Competition, Ownership, and uh, Regulation. So, uh, so, sir, may I invite uh, uh, Mr. Lene? Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Pukuda. Let me share your screen. I see familiar based uh, names like uh, Ishida, who is a colleague in the Eastern Asia Society for Transport Studies. And uh, let me see how I can share my screen. Uh, this is kind of repetition of what I presented a month ago before the Transportation Science Society of the Philippines Annual Conference, where we discuss about public transport reforms. And uh, this is actually not a new reform measure. It has been a long journey. Other cities other than Manila, all developing countries and developed countries have been trying to do so for a number of years. And uh, because of the pandemic, of course, you have uh, this kind of situation where some government see it as an opportunity to accelerate reforms while others, those who are more cautious, try to slow down. And in the case of the Philippines, we have a situation of uh, more of accelerating reforms. So the journey can actually be seen in terms of many roads going to somewhere, asking you to follow a certain path like competition, deregulation, consolidation, and a good public transport. The animation is not working very well. <laughs> uh, when you're starting with the journey, you tend to look back, to look at the first world experience and copy what they have. And as you near the second point, you're actually 
Let me see why we were having problems with this. Showing you many turns on the reform road. Huh? Yung many turns on the reform road. Yan yung yeah. Ang bumalik siya. Sa... I notice it is not uh, acting properly. <laughs> anyway, uh, there is less agreement on the path to take for a good public transport system. But of course, there is broad agreement on what makes public transport uh, good. Like this seamless transfers, onboard comfort, accessible stop and loading and loading point, reasonable journey time, predictability, reliability, high frequency, and of course, affordable fares. But the path or journey need not be as puzzling as a Rubik's Cube. My early exploration uh, 40 years ago dealt with the two axes of competition versus regulation between a fully deregulated regime below and a public monopoly above. For example, this chart, as you can see, are overloaded uh, paratransit, the jeepney and the tricycles. These are common also in many Asian cities by different names. And shown to different two economies, they will immediately jump to the, to the conclusion that it is a case of supply deficiency. There is absence of competition, the regulation have restricted supply. But for those who have been in the journey so long and have done survey, will have a different conclusion. The conclusion is there are other excess units not applying because the fares are too low. In other words, the absence of a, a backhaul prevented them from providing uh, services. So the viewpoints de differ depending on your positions in the learning curve. At the early part, if you're uh, new in the journey, you may say yes, it is the absence of competition. And if you're further up on the learning curve, you may say no, it isn't. It also differs depending on your starting point in the queue, uh, which I call now the three axes of ownership, competition, regulation, regulation, X, Y, Z. So you have different choices depending on your situation. You can either be fully public transport, monopoly, like this one on C4, which is common to many uh, first world countries. But for develop, developing countries like the Philippines, you are more in the different category where you have a C2 frame as you can see here. And a recent uh, popular framework being uh, uh, discussed is the so-called STO framework of Tredbo, a conference series dealing with public transport reforms. And STO is strategic, tactical, and operational. It's a little bit confusing, but when you look at the related to, the, to this cube, Strategic is nothing more than a movement in two dimensions trying to get out of one cube. While tactical is you, you remain within the cube, you may move the change position of the public transport in one dimension. And the operational part is you don't change any dimension except some improvement. The view of first world cities is really that of C1 or C4, what they call C4, this orange cube, which unfortunately is not going out because of the limitations for some reason. The sharing does not include the, does not include the, the animation that I put into the, in the, the PowerPoint. But in any case, the objective of First World Cities is really to unbundle overall to reduce their level of subsidy and they're doing this by terms of service contracting or some bundles or portions of the public transit operation or functions 
is being given out to private sector, a kind of privatization. On the other hand, the view of third world cities, what I call the threadbare countries like the Philippines, is of the sea too. They have weak institutions. Competition is many, like almost unlimited. Ownership is totally public. Uh, but you have weak institutions. So the reform thread is not about reducing subsidy, but in terms of consolidation, strengthening regulation, and a movement along the x-axis. No movement on the x-axis. Nobody wants to nationalize or take over the system. Uh, one way actually to speed up the journey is to look back at reforms the last five years, to 45 years. And here is the case of the Philippines in relation to other reforms that happened in the country. I was in the government and the project leader of the first bus consolidation movement uh, program in 1975-76. Uh, we succeeded in consolidating 120 or so operators to 14 bus consortia. They were called the color-coded library and routes. Then in the 1990s, this was dismantled. The consortia was dismantled under a different philosophy of deregulation and devolution. So the consortia were disbanded. And now, 2015, up to the present, there is a move to, re to reconsolidate bus again. And there is also a corresponding parallel move to consolidate the small paratransit jeepneys numbering about 60,000 in Metro Manila. What were the iconic projects in the 70s, which is the lab bus? Then in the 2015 era, we have the Cebu BRT, which was supposed to started in 2013, but up to now incomplete. So there is now fascination about BRT and Metro Manila, somebody is pushing the EDSA or the C4, uh, the main thoroughfare pair avenue, to be a BRT, despite the fact that there is already an existing MRT3, MRT system on the same corridor or on the same route. If you look at the other Asian cities, Bangkok was the exception in terms of the consolidation. It went for a public transport monopoly called Bangkok Mass Transit Authority. Singapore did it in stages. And right now it's still private and the, the bus companies in Singapore are still few but not single and they have branched out into other services. Taipei during this period of 1990s built its 11 busways and the BMTA in Bangkok started doing some private uh, contracting apparently <laughs> to reduce their subsidy, level of subsidy. The literature, the global literature or ideology that were influencing all these reforms are also changed. You know, in the 1970s, the World Bank and other multilateral institutions favored unfettered competition. Now they're talking about limited competition and they're promoting BRT as the solution for all problems of developing countries. The bus consolidation version of 2020 of the, in, the, in Manila is there are now more than 600 operators. You consolidate into 31 because there are 31 routes. The existing operators will reapply and they will have color coding. There was some problem with this because if you look at the route as per design, you can actually limit the operations for efficiency into seven six to seven bus operators. You, it took out overlap of the routes on the main thoroughfare, which is the circumferential four, thereby increasing the number or making it difficult for transfers from these radial routes to the circumferential route. Ignoring the fact that the level of demand or the load profile on the circumferential four is very uneven. This is a comparison of the consolidation in the 70s and the consolidation in the 2020s. And you can see from here in the course comparison that the recent consolidation is headed for, or is doomed to fail. 
there is no project team full time dealing with the project with the bus companies. The root structure was imposed from above while before we had the bus operators consulted, talking with us what is the proper arrangement. So there was a back and forth. But in this case, and what a telling change also is we did not reduce the number of buses in the 1970s. But now the government wants to reduce 10,000 bus units in Metro Manila to about 4,600. The Public Utility Vehicle Modernization Program is similar to the bus consolidation except that address the so-called jeepneys, the paratransit, the silom or samlor or the lamat in other developing countries. It's asking the local government to redesign the routes and after the routes are designed, redesigned, the jeepneys will have to consolidate one cooperative, one route. Of course, this is based on dubious assumptions that the new vehicle will be viable on the same old pair, which of course it's not because the price of the new unit is nearly 10 times that of the old. And it assumes that LGU can prepare uh, route plans based on guidelines on some one-month lecture. And that consolidation will happen because it was ordered from the top. One other measure adopted what I called service contracting was copied from Europe and Northern American country during the pandemic, where bus operators, a number of bus operators and jeepneys were contracted and paid for. So the payers were totally free during the pandemic period. The problem with this, of course, many operators were not paid on time and could not be paid because of the messy administrative problem of paying thousands of operators. There was no prior condition of operators being organized. So if you look back at the cube, the trifecta cube I mentioned earlier, this measure is starting, this is starting from the wrong place in the reform uh, journey. Now, as I realize after 40 years, there are certain things I could say with much uh, confidence that public monopoly is to be prepared when there is economies of scale and the public institutions are strong or competent. Like you can see that in Singapore and Hong Kong, but not in most developing countries. In the case of developing countries, government is often a bad manager it has the reverse touch of turning gold into bronze. And if you look at the competitive markets which you have now, you don't really need a lot of government regulation or government time. The problem we are facing is how to balance the too many operators with too few operators. With too many, you cannot distinguish <coughs> the good from the bad, so commuters cannot make the choices. But I cannot also dismiss the fact that many of the reformers or so-called advocates of reforms are simply following. Huh? Are only following foreign or imported ideas. After many years, there are still. After many years, there are still many questions that remain in my mind. One of them, why is public transport modernization equated with corporatization or amalgamation? Can the thousands of small operators we have in most developing countries be coordinated or integrated without corporate consolidation? In that sense, is the public utility vehicle modernization program need saving or can it be saved at all? And the old playbook on bus consolidation, can it lead to a new outcome? And in talking about this, let's not forget that of the 1,600 municipalities or villages, towns in the Philippines, more than 1,400 really are not dependent on bus or jeepney. They are dependent on what you call the tricycle mode of operation. Before I conclude, let me go back to the framework of 
thread draw or thread bow. Thread bow has talked about tactics, about strategies, about operation, but it has not talked about the component of policies which is missing from its framework. That's why I find it inadequate. Aside from that, it forgets the necessary pacing of reforms from forecasting, planning, implementation, and planning for implementation. With that, I would like to thank you for uh, listening. Just to summarize uh, a few points, uh, public transport reforms in the Philippines has been accelerated during the pandemic, but it's doomed to fail. I think uh, it's following models which are not suited to the conditions we are in. And therefore, it provides a lesson on what not to do for other developing countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your presentation. So, uh, time is a me so uh, may I invite the fourth speaker? So, next speaker is uh, Associate Professor Apiwat Tatanwarha. Uh, he's a Associate Professor of the uh, Chiralongu University. And uh, uh, about his educational background, he is incredible gorgeous, I think. I believe that he graduated uh, University of Tokyo and then he get uh, he moved to the Cambridge and uh, also MIT and get the two master. Then he get a doctoral degree from MIT and he moved to the Harvard as a, like a visiting researcher. Then he back and uh, now he work at the Chiranko University and uh, recently, uh, actually this year, he awarded National Outstanding Researcher, right? So his uh, topics is urban development and mobility in Thailand post-COVID, uh, whether uh, we bound. So, Dr. Piwat? Yes. You to press that, sorry. Thank you. Uh, if uh, we could have the slide, uh, please. Thank you very much for um, the, uh, the kind introduction. Um, so uh, the, the topic that I would like to, um, to talk today uh, is probably, uh, um, I'm not sure if it's directly, re well, it's, it's certainly, I hope it's directly related to uh, our conversation. But um, I, I'm trying to look uh, at the future of, um, of urban development and mobility in Thailand uh, really, really post-COVID. So I'm trying to, um, uh, to get us out of this uh, uh, short-term perspective. I, I think a lot of people have already talked about the short-term perspective, but um, I, I, I would rather talk about something uh, a little bit of uh, long-term. Um, okay, uh, all right. Is it moving? Is it not moving? Is it moving? Okay, all right, I guess it is moving. Okay, so um, we, we know that um, uh, we are dealing with a lot of uh, VUCA um, uh, situations. Um, COVID is very, uh, it's, it's, it's basically uh, makes us realize that uh, we live in a very volatile world uh, everything is, uh, is uncertain. I mean, in fact, we don't know if tomorrow uh, we'll be able to gather uh, because of the uh, Omicron um, situation. Um, at the same time, um, uh, when it comes to urban development and uh, mobility issues, it's no longer about an engineering uh, solution that we have to deal with, and it's because it's so complex. Uh, everything is, is related. And even uh, the term mobility, uh, you know, and even development as a term is, is an, an ambiguous uh, term. Uh, we can't just define, uh, you know, everything from the textbook that we learned uh, 20 years ago, right? But on the other hand, uh, as a, um, a policy uh, maker would say, we do need, um, well, I actually just 
came up with this SCSC thing. Let's call it the double SC. So we do need some uh, stability in the system. Uh, we can't just let everything uh, be volatile because that would be very difficult to deal with. As um, uh, Dr. Akum said earlier, um, you know, e even in the, the world of economic policy, we do still need some stability in the system. We can't just let everything, you know, uh, run amok and, and become volatile. At the same time, um, in terms of policy, we do need some simplicity uh, in the policy. We, you know, even though everything is so complex, as a researcher, as a policymaker, we still need to make something uh, simple enough for us to be able to grasp with the situation. Certainly, we need some clarification of the complex system and ambiguous issues. Um, so we have this dilemma uh, in urban development and mobility uh, policymaking. Um, we talk a lot about infrastructure uh, here, and, 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 and previous uh, speakers have mentioned um, investment in a large um, urban infrastructure. And we know that infrastructure stays with us for a long time. The subways stay with us, you know, 100 years, if not longer, right? Um, everything we're investing today will be with the city for a long, long time. But yet, uh, when we study uh, urban development and, and mobility, we do have assumptions. And our assumptions about um, uh, behaviors and lifestyles of people tend to be short-term, right? When we run our models, I mean, a lot of us are... Uh, modelers here uh, in this room, uh, we have this sort of um, dilemma. On the one hand, we're trying to build the city for the long run, but a lot of assumptions that we use tend to be short-term. So, so I think there's some potential use of a um, certain discipline called um, future studies or uh, strategic foresight. When we think about the world, it's, that's very uncertain, particularly the world um, 10 or 20 years from now will be very different from what we see today. So we really have to figure out in, in the way we think about the world, not just now, but in the future, what are really certain and what are not uncertain. And then we can, if we can separate them and sort of analyze the level of uncertainty of different uh, factors, we should be able to figure out better uh, what kinds of initiatives we can uh, propose. And certainly, uh, we really have to distinguish between, all, among all these terms, uh, the trends, um, you know, how things are changing at the moment, and the drivers or the factors that would determine, will determine the trends, as well as in the case of COVID, for example, the wild cards that we really have to uh, be careful about. Not just the pandemic, but also like earthquake and things like that. Those are known wild cards. So how do we actually incorporate all different factors when we think about urban development and mobility uh, systems in the future? So um, in, um, in future studies and strategic foresight, um, they do have uh, a certain conceptual framework uh, to think about the future. Uh, a lot of us, when we do uh, mathematical modeling, we tend to focus on projected and possibly uh, probable uh, futures, right? We basically extrapolate the trend into the future. But futures tend uh, to not be continuous, right? A lot of times they're discrete, and a lot of times they're out of nowhere of certain value that we didn't think of them before. So um, the way we think about, you know, long-term perspective about urban development and mobility, we really have to incorporate all these scenarios and certain wild cards and sometimes some, um, uh, uh, you know, some things that are just beyond our current imagination, and just, just to keep that in mind. Otherwise, we will end up uh, being in the same situation like we are now uh, with, with COVID. So um, I would like to um, give uh, some um, thoughts about what I think are relatively certain for Thailand as we think about urban development and mobility uh, uh, for Thailand in the next 20 years. Um, and this, this certainly is, is sort of my humble, bold prediction. Uh, Thailand is no longer, well, I mean, uh, right now you go to certain places, you still feel that there's some rural 
uh, places in Thailand. But I think in the next 10, 20 years, Thailand is no longer uh, you know, a rural uh, country anymore. I mean, you, you will probably go to certain places and you feel that they're rural, but in fact, people are already urban. And in one of my studies, um, we're looking into basically the future of urban living in Thailand. Um, by the definition of the government, uh, we think, um, well, the definition basically uh, calculate the number of population living in municipalities, and it's about 50, uh, 45 to 50 percent, depending on how you calculate it. If you include some um, a floating population, uh, or those who are not registered, it, it, it's up to about 50 percent of people living in cities in Thailand. But but people are not like that. People people uh, consume like they are urban people, right? If 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 um, if you if you follow 7-Eleven or convenience stores, um, you can basically uh, identify where the cities really are. Cities, as in how people live as urban people, not cities as in agglomeration of houses uh, like we used to uh, to define. So. We think uh, in our research team that uh, at this point, if we defined um, urban population in Thailand by consumption pattern, and that includes how people move, um, or you know, um, you know, travel, um, it's pretty much up to 72 percent already. So, and this is 2020. So, um, in 10 or 20 years' time, uh, we expect that you know most people in Thailand will become urban, but. The urban country that Thailand will become in the next 20 years will not be just what we think it is going to be. Um, what I call a tale of two cities, meaning uh, it's, it's no longer, Thailand will not be just about um, urban Thailand and rural Thailand. It's going to be about the large city people and small city people. And large cities will be primarily people with younger population and because of agglomeration economies, uh, things, people, you know, there will be a lot of activities going on. So Bangkok, Chiang Mai, Phuket, and all these um, cities will be growing because of agglomeration economies. But the flip side of that urban Thailand would be um, small and relatively old uh, population and shrinking population, right? So you have this dichotomy of Thailand of growing cities with younger people and uh, smaller cities with older people and shrinking, both in terms of population and economic base. And, and we, we compile some data, and we often you know, think of Thailand as, you know, Bangkok as, as sort of the issue for urban development and mobility issues for Thailand, right? But if you look at the number that I put up here, uh, 40, um, about 40 percent, 44 percent of population in Thailand actually live in shrinking cities at the moment. But we don't actually have any strategy in terms of urban development and mobility for those people. So we're actually ignoring a lot of people uh, in this country by focusing on just large cities in our country. So uh, in, uh, in future studies, uh, basically you just, uh, as simple as, divide uh, futures into two categories. One is what we call the baseline future, which is primarily the extrapolation of the current trends. And the other one is what we call scenarios or um, alternative futures, uh, which is based on uncertain uh, variables, uncertain factors. Even experts cannot agree uh, which direction the future uh, will, will go. So let me uh, be a little bold and, and, and suggest a few controversial uh, projections here. So baseline future for the uh, urban lifestyles in Bangkok and big cities will become like this. And I think these are pretty straightforward and, and you, will, uh, you, you will see that it's, it's something that we already discussed. First of all, our lives will be based on platforms 24-7. Right? It's not just about, um, you know, when you sleep, you cannot escape the platforms. A lot of us have all these uh, wearables that, that we have, and that's, that will track us uh, throughout. Um, the second one is AI and robotics uh, will, will be 
the thing that we have to rely on. It's not just the platform that we rely on, but AI and robotics will be everywhere in our life. Um, as we know, I mean, in this uh, uh, conference, we already have this uh, quasi-metaverse going on, I assume. And um, people will be more cosmopolitan um, in the sense that uh, you see diversity. And this is because Thailand will never be able to get out of this um, reliance on tourism. I and mean, with tourism and globalization, um, more people will be more cosmopolitan in the sense that uh, diversity is, is part of life. But at the same time, um, we are not the traditional societies like we used to. I mean, uh, and this is important for even mobility people because, you know, a lot of research is focused on how family move, how, how family live. But imagine this. If most people are single, or even when they're married, they don't have kids, that type of assumption is key. And how, how we are going to deal with this kind of situation is important, not just in terms of policy, but also in terms of academic inquiry. Inequality, um, I mean, this is a big issue for Thailand, as you know. But the trend is that younger people, and I think in general, uh, uh, sustainable consumption and, and production uh, will be, uh, will be the, the key, and, and it's also the trend as well. Now, but the certain uncertainty uh, that I see, um, and, and bringing it back to urban development and mobility a little bit, uh, for short term, um, so we're, I, well, I and um, our team are not sure. Um, after COVID, in, in terms of short term, are people coming back to public transportation? I mean, before COVID, uh, you know, people were riding the BTS, the subways, and, you know, the ridership was sort of going up. But as you know, um, during COVID, that had gone down. So we don't know if um, public transportation and ride-hailing applications will be able to compete against um, private vehicles, ownership, and usage. But elsewhere, uh, the picture is different uh, from our sort of, you know, qualitative analysis. Um, in, in smaller cities, you, almost public transportation is, 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 is probably too little too late at this point. Um, so it's a matter of how, um, you know, mobility as a service or uh, ride-hailing applications will compete against uh, private vehicles. But in the long term, uh, we can't just look at mobility and look at the trends, right? Because we do need to look at how human settlements will will be in the next 10 or 20 years. In, in terms of Bangkok, it's a little bit interesting because even though we're discussing work from home, uh, digitalization, uh, platforms and stuff like that, uh, you may or may not know that uh, real estate um, development is going on rapidly in the city of Bangkok. And in the next five years, there will be almost two million square meters office space in the city center, right? What does it mean? It means that um, the locations of jobs and offices will still be uh, concentrated in the city center. Even though we say that, all right, a lot of people are going to work from home, right? And yet the, the locations of jobs are still very concentrated in the city center. What does it mean for mobility? It means that people will still have to commute to the city regardless of the opportunities to work from home. On the other hand, uh, people who can, who can work from home at the moment are, are t tend to be white collar jobs. But Bangkok has a lot of non-white collar jobs which require physical um, proximity, right? Which means, um, you know, the, the the possibility of um, decentralized job locations in Bangkok uh, would be very difficult. So we don't know um, whether suburbanization will continue or there's some reconcentration of, of uh, you know, residents and jobs in the city. Elsewhere, as in a smaller town, I think at this point, um, it's, it's a matter of how fast uh, these cities will shrink. Uh, in terms of um, population and um, economic decline. It's a little bit sad, but it's rather uh, realistic. So uh, my humble predictions um, for Bangkok, 
So I, I think we'll, we'll probably go back. I mean, yesterday, uh, traffic jam in Bangkok was horrible if you were here. Uh, so I think we'll go back to pre-COVID situations. Um, I, I'm not so sure that you know, digitalization will be able to uh, take us away from this uh, agglomeration power uh, as, as we hope it will. So I say we will face the same old challenges. Um, let me skip this one. Um, but the old challenges, and this, these are the long-term um, um, challenges that I think humanity is facing. Um, so I, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, the Lord of the, uh, Lord of the Rings. So you know, one one ring to rule them all. But in this case, is three of them. One is climate change, as we know. The second is inequality, and the third one is you know the disruption of all technologies from uh, metaverse, from uh, AI, robotics, and um, artificial intelligence, and all. So these are the three things that we really have to pay attention to if we want to plan for uh, the long-term future. Now, the tricky part, and it's, it's shifting a little bit to, to policy here, there are two things that I think we, we as in people who work in urban development and, um, and mobility policy have to consider. And, and this would take you out a little bit of your comfort zone of uh, you know, mobility and transportation planning. Um, there, there, and I think this may sort of respond to uh, Kunakom's earlier uh, statement. Um, Thailand will face two decouplings. One is the, uh, de we have to decouple economic growth uh, from resource use. And this is what you all are trying to do, right? We want to still uh, develop Thailand economically and yet use uh, little or less resources electrification, you know, all these efficient transportation systems is pretty much that. We still want to be able to grow economically while, use, while using less uh, energy. But at the same time, because of the, the, um, the introduction of uh, um, technologies, we will be able to increase productivity, but the wage of the, the workers uh, will not go up. And these are the dilemmas that I will show you uh, why that's, that's important. Not just for people who work in economic policy, a little bit like me, but you who work in the mobility sector. Um, this is the, the, the dilemmas that we are facing. Because of climate change and because of everything that's, that's happening, we want the big push but we also want the small pool. And I'll explain um, right now. Because we want the whole system to change from fossil fuel system, mobility system, uh, fossil fuel based mobility system to more renewable energy or you know, more sustainable um, transportation system. We do need that transition. It's not a gradual transition. It's, a, it's almost like you're, uh, you're flipping the whole uh, system altogether, right? Which means we need a lot of investment. It's, it's going to be almost like in the United States or in Korea or in Europe or maybe in Japan. It's almost like we need a Green New Deal for Thailand, right? But that requires some strong state power, right? We need that, we need that decisive action on the government Right? Because infrastructure is not you know, fixing you know, the little things here and there, nuts and bolts. You need to change the whole thing. So we need a strong state. But on the other hand, we know that inequality is a big issue for Thailand. Right? So, so that's why you need that justice, you know, how, how you transform it with some justice issues in mind. Take, take, the, take the issue of, um, say, um, right hailing applications. I mean, that's great, right? It's very efficient, it's good. But you have a lot of labor issues with right hailings at the moment, right? So the issues between um, capital in urban development and mobility and the labor, you know, transportation workers who support the system, that is the crux of the issue that we will continue to face in dealing with mobility uh, policy in the future. 
So this is my last slide. Um, it may actually take we, us away a little bit from, uh, from you know, the sort of technical uh, perspective about urban development and, uh, and, and, uh, and mobility. But I think as we think about the future of urban development and mobility in this post-COVID world, but way into the future, First, I think the spatial inequality issue matters a big deal. Uh, we tend to think of Bangkok as everything, all the money in infrastructure development, you know, the transition to EV, for example, uh, we put a lot of that into Bangkok. Take rail infrastructure, for example, right? Other cities in Thailand get almost nothing for rail development, okay? So I think, First thing first, we need to pay more attention to secondary cities. There's some potential for growing uh, some business there, right? But at the same time, shrinking cities will require totally different ways to think about um, urban development and mobility. You can't just build infrastructure in small towns that are shrinking and hoping that people will move to those places. No way, right? Build it and they will come will never be the right approach. So you can't just put money, build infrastructure, and think that people will move there. You need local economic development, and that's the bottom line. The second one is that, as we know, uh, mobility issues are not just technical issue. I think all of us have become, well, we can't become politicians, but we have to be considerate about um, the... Um, uh, social, political, and the technical barriers that we face and how to come up with the right strategies for each different kinds of, um, of cities. And that the last part, we tend to think of inclusive mobility as sort of the afterthought. And that is, is, that's what we always do, right? We build the system first, oops, sorry, we have to fix the problems. I don't think that's, that's the way we, we, can't, we, we, have to, we have to think beyond that. We have to think of how we actually can integrate you know, all these minority uh, people, smaller towns into a, a larger picture of um, urban development and mobility policies for Thailand. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nguong, can you help me? Because I cannot see the floor. <laughs> so, uh, okay, thank you uh, for presenters. Uh, I, maybe we don't have much time, but uh, if possible, I would like to accept uh, several questions or comments from floor, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I cannot see the floor. So, does it, anyone help? Uh, no, yeah, can yes, you I'm help here. Me? Yes. Present, yes, yes. Any, any, <clears throat> anyone on, on site participant has some question or comment, please? Anyone? No. 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 How about the online participant? Uh, any? Yes. Uh, or even the presenters also can have questions. If no, I, I have many questions. <laughs> Who else do you have questions for Sensei? Now we, and now we're just showing the Zoom screen, just in case that anyone raise their hand for any question or comment. Any questions? Because if no, maybe I will have, but uh, no, no comments from floor. Okay, uh, when you think the questions, maybe I have some questions. Uh, for Professor Ishida, uh, I just wondering that the, is there any influence of the COVID-19 infection to the our smart city policy in Japan after this? Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, they are now thinking how to uh, uh, to how to react the COVID-19 influence but so far uh no 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 such a uh, good practice uh, one ex ex exemption 
uh, one example, but I, I, I let me uh, give you the one example in the field of mobility, new mobility services. And uh, as you know, maybe uh, we have the same experience in uh, Japan, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, and Thailand. The number of passengers are decreasing, especially uh, both in intercity uh, travel and the intercity travel. And the, uh, so to 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 so to keep the sustainability of uh, public transport uh, businesses, uh, they uh, especially the private sector railway companies are trying to improve their uh, revenue resources to expand to uh, more to the other areas than the railway business itself, to the shopping, yeah, and the uh, uh, tourism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in this regard, uh, in these areas, uh, mass or other IT technologies are uh, very active. That is uh, one small example of the improvement of smart city project in Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyway, I'm very impressed that you mentioned the smart city flavor. <laughs> I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> I also yeah. feel the same thing. Thank you, sir. So, okay, uh, for the, uh, is there any other question from floor? So, no? Okay, yes, uh, there's one question from uh, our board member. Okay, thank you. So, you can repeat it, they cannot hear. So, uh, my, my question to Professor Ishida. Uh, it's about the smart city. So thank, thank you for the presentations. So I just wonder, uh, are there any incentive from the government or for the private sector to develop the smart city? For uh, for example, in, in Thailand, we have like a tax exemption for that. So I just wonder for the, the, the Japan's uh, incentive yeah, for the private sector in the smart city development, please. Thank you very much for your comment. That's a very important point, I think. So far, the Japanese government budget for the assistance is rather limited. We have to uh, try to increase this budget. But the more important things, I think, is that how to invite the private funding resources to this new field. So the in this regard, government responsibility is to improve the environment for the investment, regulations, and the uh, speed up of uh, various uh, procedures and the improvement, etc. So far, uh, otherwise, we, we cannot expect much fund from the uh, private sectors, especially ESG fund. And that is a very important issue now, not only in the field of smart city, but also in the field of green innovation, that is a new uh, carbon neutral uh, policies. Thank you very much for your question and comment. So, Dr. Nguyen, any is there any... People have a question, no? Um, not, not from the online on site okay, this so, event. Okay, so uh, may I have the question to the, the uh, Professor Stan? I, I'm just wondering that the why so energy consumption in Indonesia is very high in transport sector. But uh, my question is uh, uh, regarding the good movements, uh, the logistics system. Because the, I, by myself, think that the COVID-19 strongly infect to the logistics system in Japan. So how, how about the situation in Indonesia and uh, how do you think in the future? Well, uh, regarding the logistics, I think we do have some inefficiency, I believe, even before the, the pandemic COVID-19. 
19. That's why we need some, some improvement in the system as well as the legal aspect over there. So uh, fortunately, I was uh, also one of the uh, member for the task force for the G20, which is I'm very much interested in proposing that this kind of issue should be raised at the national, regional, as well international level, because the reciprocal uh, legal, as well as uh, reciprocal uh, uh, transaction should be there. Yeah? So there will be no uh, high cost economy. But uh, if you go a bit further down, if you look at the level of the last delivery, yeah, the mile, last miles, yeah, the last miles delivery, no, we are encountering some problems because, say, for example, in myself, uh, maybe before the pandemic, I was not receiving maybe even one, one package in one day. But right now, not only me, but also my neighbor, my, my colleagues, my friends, they probably receiving more than four, even five packets uh, a day of uh, last delivery or the last mile delivery. So it means there, there are some growing, growing tendency of, uh, what is it, the uh, spending of people. Maybe uh, we have to go further in analysis to know whether, because they are now is uh, spending less money for the uh, person trips, but then they put the allocation of those money for the uh, uh, goods probably. So I think this is uh, very important because now, right now, there are a lot many kind of last month's delivery developed by some application. Yeah, but they are moving, I think, not in uh, an other way because uh, uh, say, for example, my experience, <coughs> why do I have to receive <coughs> five times a day of packets in my home? Yeah, it is a household levels, uh, only for different uh, type of items. Why don't they send it in only once? Because it's, tr it's troubling somehow for me because it seems that I have to open my home for 24 hours to receive that kind of package, something like that. So this is uh, a thing that we have to be able, I think, to, to be uh, ready, I mean, in the future, because I believe it wouldn't be less, rather it's going to be more and more in quantity. So, but, but it is important to maintain the quality and also the quantity of this kind of deliveries. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, at a, a lower level, but at the upper level, I think, uh, you know, there are a lot many uh, things to improve and to digitalize or not only to automate, uh, automatize the, the system. Say, for example, uh, there is some case of sending, for example, this in agro, the agro product, to send of uh, oranges, for example, coming from our own island in Java, why it costs more even as compared to uh, it costs more expensive if compared to to send uh, uh, oranges coming from China, for example. So this is a very, very uh, serious situation that we have to be able to recover, I think, in the coming years, because uh, the spending, the expenditure for this kind of logistic or the uh, practical movement is, is becoming very, very high. Uh, I, I, I'm not there to say that. Uh, there are a lot many also some, what is it, a sort of uh, illegal illegal actions yeah, along the supply chains management. That's why I was uh, promoting also in this case, and I would like also to propose to the government that we have to be able, I think, to digitalize, yeah, digitalize and also to, to make some uh, less face-to-face -face interaction during the supply chains management. And it was also my experience during uh, my my position as the uh, logistic and uh, distribution director at the cement industry, uh, because I, I face at the time I was so I was facing so many problems yeah, during my supply chains management from the uh, from the industry to the, uh, the customer or maybe the retailer or the end users. But it's been many years. But I don't know why it hasn't reduced. Fukuda Sensei, you can imagine. Uh, in, in maybe not right now, but uh, many years back, to have one liter of gasoline in Java Island, probably it will cost you like uh, five thousand 
rupiah. Whereas in Papua, whereas in Papua, in the same country, you will find that you may have to pay probably 10 times of the same liter of gasoline. And it is also, and it's also happening also with other products like cement. Yeah, cement also, well, one, one, one a pack of cement, I, I may have to pay only 50,000 at a time in, in Java Island. But then in Papua, you may have probably to pay 20 times, like 1 million rupiah. So you can imagine, it is something wrong, I think, because I believe the, the price in the market will be equal to production costs and distribution costs. Production costs will be the same because you are also guaranteed what the, with, with the uh, standard national uh, <coughs> standard national of quality. But the variable is, I think, is the distribution costs. And it means that we have to minimize the logistic costs or, or maybe to have uh, some changes to make that more effective and efficient for that. Otherwise, it's going to be a high cost economy for the rest of the years. <laughs> I think that that will, that will be my answer. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Uh, actually, I would like to discuss many things, but uh, maybe time is away. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, okay, yes. Uh, Dr. Nuon, is there any people have a question? No? Uh, yeah, uh, one, one, more, one more question uh, from yeah, Dr. Uh, Sarawit. Uh, hello, this is Sarawit. Uh, I'd like to have uh, a uh, kind of the general comment from uh, Mr. Rennie Santiago. Um, you mentioned about modernization of the conventional public transport. I'd like to hear whether, because we have like new coming, like share economy, car sharing, and all the share vehicles, uh, it will change the institution, regulation, and also competition. And do you have any comments on the coming uh, services like that, please? Uh, could you rephrase your question? I did not quite get what you're trying to. Can you repeat? Um, yeah. I'd like to hear the comment it. on the uh, the coming emerging shared uh, services like uh, car sharing and all that stuff, and how because it will change a lot of things like institution competition to the conventional public transport. Oh, okay. Actually, I sort of alluded to it as the the driver that could change the model of consolidation of, you know, in many Asian countries, you really have so many thousands of service providers, small mom and pop transport providers. But consolidating them into one corporation is simply impossible, and I don't think that is the right approach. And I think this shared concept for digital technology should allow that. In other words, uh, which is actually demonstrated by Uber when I talk to them and Grab, how do they uh, integrate operation of thousands of cars without ownership of all the cars? And I said, the same model, if you apply it to the public transit mode, you could do it. And I think there was one uh, digital uh, developer that I talked to where you could actually ship to a mobility as a service where he can see which uh, paratransit or bus is arriving at a particular point, whether it's vacancy so he can move and plan his trip to go to the bus stop at that particular time and wait for it. So that to me is the way to go rather than consolidation. You could get thousands of operators to operate as one integrated system without corporate measure through digital technology. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, there's no more questions from the okay. on-site participants. So, uh, can I have one more question to the uh, Mr. Rene? Uh, sure. In Japan, also we discussed sometime the consolidation of the private bus operators. But uh, one of the big barriers is the uh, labor union in Japan, actually. <laughs> so how about in the Philippines? Uh, <laughs> labor union is not much of a problem, but owners don't want to merge with somebody they don't agree with. 
And that was our experience seven. They have to find a partner that they're willing to live with. But because technology has arrived, I think we don't really have to marry them in the same house. They could coexist and collaborate through a system. In Japan, all of us companies have a deficit. So they don't want to merge the deficit, <laughs> become bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank so, you. Thank you very much. So, any other question to Dr. Apiwat? Uh, no. Uh, doc yeah. No, Dr. Apiwat? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you studied in Japan, so you know the, our situation. Mm. Uh, in Japan, also, once many people uh, can come to the Tokyo, not only one place, but the Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya. Then our government have national comprehensive plan and they try to you know uh, develop the countryside. But when I work in the Thailand, you don't have the like a, a national comprehensive plan, Kaku, like Japan. So I always feel the lack of the plan. How do you think? Uh, we used to have actually um, up until the. National Economic and Development Plan number four or five. We used to have some sort of overall picture of the urban systems and rural settlements policy in Thailand. And then we sort of forgot that. Um, okay. you know, in, in the past 20 years, I mean, I've been back and working here for um, almost 25 years. Um, and I think we lost that sense of how to actually develop smaller towns in Thailand. And we still have some programs for rural development, uh, but that is not the same as small towns and small cities. Yeah. But my concern is that um, without some um, strategic intervention, uh, Thailand would be like Japan, but even worse. Because in the case of Japan, you still have a lot of shrinking cities, even with good infrastructure. Right. I mean, you go to small towns in Japan, everywhere you see good roads, good hospitals, good schools, railways even. And even that, people are still moving to Tokyo and Osaka, right? In Thailand, there isn't even that. So I would say the population of rural towns and small towns in Thailand will become even more pronounced than in Japan. And it would be very, if, if, even more difficult to, uh, to deal with the future of those places because of aging, poor, and unconnected um, you know, uh, um, urban systems there. So I'm, I'm actually, even though, you know, um, if you asked me the same question 20 years ago, I would, I would probably be like a mainstream economist and say, just focus on big cities. That's where productivity is. But lately, I'm, I'm leaning towards more spending more money and investment in, in secondary and tertiary and small towns. Because I think, um, and my prediction could be wrong, but uh, we know that Bangkok is getting bigger, and the risk of Bangkok is getting higher and higher. So from a uh, 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 risk and resilience perspective, we should actually think about um, uh, you know, dispersing, dispersive urban policy. Because the moment we put everything into this city, I mean, if it grows, it's fine. But if it doesn't grow, then we do. In fact, I want to end by promoting uh, a Japanese um, uh, drama called Japan Sing. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, it's, I think it's on TBS or something. It's a great, great um, story about how um, the government of Japan, the bureaucrats, the technocrats, are thinking about the future. And when Japan sinks, what you can do to deal with that. So um, I think that kind of strategic thinking that incorporates risk and uncertainty is not here in Thailand at all. Um, and urban development and mobility issues, I think, are important part of that thinking, which I think Japan have, but we don't, so.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rene said that he agree about your opinion. Yes. Uh, I'm very sorry, Dr. Nguyen. I think actually very interesting. I would like to continue to discuss more, but the time already passed the 15 minutes. So may I return to yes. you? Yes, thank so you. So anyway, thank you for all uh, presenters. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, all the uh, speakers. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Okay, thank you very much. See you. So, uh, so the lunch. Good to see you, Haruda Sensei. The lunch will be served uh, on this floor, uh, on the floor restaurant. So, for the on-site <laughs> participant, please kindly uh, exit to this. And then we'll be back uh, at around 1 o'clock or 43 minutes from now. So, we have a very efficient lunch and then we come back here for the afternoon session. Thank you very much. Thank you.